classic and English poetry, we had to read more Shakespeare in particular. We could read uh, from Twelfth Night. Uh, mm, as we're trying to see how to retune up the English sky with the thing, the music of the spheres, uh, which was not forgotten in the East. Uh, Hmm. It's not forgotten. <laughs> now we come to the Twelfth Night. However, the role of music is so obviously fundamental to the spirit of the play that it is momentarily surprising to find so little speculative music brought up for discussion. But I think that on consideration of the nature of the play itself, the place of both active and intellectual music and the relations between them emerge as some, something far more complex than Shakespeare had hitherto caused to employ. Twelfth Night is in very serious ways a play about parties and what they do to people. This is like when you go out and have a party, a feast. Mm -hmm. So it's about the effect of the feast, full of games, revels, tricks, and disguises. It is an epiphany play at a ritualized twelfth night, rich festivity of itself, but it is much more than this. The play gives us an analysis as well as a representation of feasting. It develops an ethic of indulgence based on the notion that the personality of an individual is a function not of the static proportions of the humors within him, but of the dynamic appetites that may more purposefully as well as more pragmatically be said to govern his behavior. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, about it's about partying. About, mm -hmm. uh, he loses his Superficially close. Uh -huh. To comedy of humors in the characterological extremes of its dramatic as persona. The play nevertheless seems almost intent on destroying the whole theory of comedy and of morality entailed by the comedy of humors. The nature of revels is disclosed in the first scene. The materials are to be music, food, and drink, and love. <laughs> Are those the main topics? Mm -hmm. So he's trying to talk about music, food, drink, and love. The basic action of both festivity in general and of the play itself is declared to be that of a so surfeiting the appetite. Is that where you satisfy the appetite? Mm, they, they Mm -hmm. come out, uh, sick. <laughs> so fighting the appetite that it will sicken and die, leaving fulfilled the tempered, harmonious self. So in other words, if we go and watch The Twelfth Night by Shakespeare, what will satisfy our appetite, well, it'll fulfill us, we'll be tempered, harmonious selves. <laughs> I mean, he intervened if you look at it. He did, if you live that type of life, but it, dear, if we go to Shakespeare's play, we can then become harmonious and listen to the music of the spheres. So. Uh, you reject mm -hmm. that, and you mm -hmm. see the other The self, the movement of the whole play is that of a party, from appetite through the direction of that appetite to outward towards something to satiation, eventually to the condition where, when as the Duke hopes for Olivia, Liver, brain, and heart, these sovereign thrones are all supplied and filled her sweet perfections with one self king. Uh -huh. Your one self could become the king. Uh -huh. The one self king, quote, the one self king, unquote, is the final harmonious state to be achieved by each reveler, but it is uh, also in both. Dukes and Olivia's case, Cicero, who kills, quote, the flock of all affections, else, unquote, that live in them, and who is shown forth in an eternal, literal epiphany in the last act. 
The Duke's opening speech describes both the action of feasting and his own abundant ursine romantic temperament, but it also contains within it an emblematic representation of the action of surfighting. Po po quote from the play Twelfth Night. If food be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it, that surfighting the appetite may sicken and so die. That strain again, I had a dying fall. Oh, it came over my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Enough, no more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. <laughs> From scene one, one, one to eight. The one personage in the play who remains a melancholic, humorous character is the one person who is outside the revels and he cannot be affected by them. There's somebody who's not partying effectively, dear. Mm -hmm. He's not joining in the fun. <laughs> Olivia's rebuke cuts to, we have to see Twelfth Night now, cuts to the heart of his nature. Anything cut off it. Thou art, quote, thou art sick of self-love, Malfolio, and taste with a distempered appetite, unquote, suffering from a kind of mortal indigestion. Malfolio's true character is revealed in his involuted, puranical sensibility. He's no fun. Roman, mostly Roman. Dear, he's puranical. He's not having any fun, and he's not drinking, eating food. And that always be one. Tyrannical sensibility that allows of no appetites directed outwards. His rhetorical is full of the devil. It is full of humors and elements as well. The other character tends to mention these save and jest, for it is only Melfolio who be believes in them, yet real external fluids of all kinds, wine, tears, seawater, urine, finally the rain of inevitably brief Inevitability bathed the whole world of Alicia, Alelia, in constant reference throughout the play. Now, the general concern of Twelfth Night, then, is musica humana, <laughs> the Boethian application of abstract order and proportion to human behavior, the literalization of the universal harmony that is accomplished in comedy of humors, however, is unequivocally rejected. I want me to read that again. The general concern of Twelfth Night, then, is musica humana, the Boethian application of abstract order and pro proportion to human behavior, the literalization of the universal harmony that is accomplished in comedy of humors however is unequivocally rejected quote does not our life consist of the four elements katharikais is sir toby quote faith so they say replies sir andrew quote but i think it rather consists of eating and drinking <laughs> do you think it is just eating and drinking Part of it, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. We eat a lot, don't we? Mm -hmm. No. We don't drink booze per se, but. Thou, thou art a scholar, acknowledges Sir Toby. Quote, Let us therefore eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Quote, Who you are and what you would are out of my Wilkins. I might say element, but the word is overrun, warns, says Festi, who taking offense at Malfolio's characterization as him as a dry fool. You think you could be a fool if you're dry? Touches off the whole proceedings against the unfortunate Stuart. The plot to ridicule Malfolio is more than the frolicsome revenge of an avowed fool. It serves both to put down the killjoy. Some people are just no fun. They say he's a killjoy. And to affirm the psychology of appetite and fulfillment that governs the play to the degree that the musica humana of Twelfth Night involves the substitution of an alternative view to the fairly standard 16th century descriptions of the order of the passions. An application of the musical metaphor would be trivial and perhaps misleading, but the operation of practical music 
in the pot, amazingly naturalistic treatment of its various forms and the conclusions implied as to the nature and effects of music in both the context of celebration, celebrate, and the world at large all result in some musical speculation that remains one of the play's unnoticed accomplishments. Uh -huh. Seems he's speculating on the nature of music uh -huh. and harmony in people, uh -huh. how to achieve the music of the spheres. Uh -huh. If you just watch his play, you could be satisfied. Uh -huh. The actual music in Twelfth Night starts and finishes the play, occurring throughout on different occasions, in different styles, the presumably instrumental piece in, in which the Duke wallows at the opening dampens his desire for very, for it very quickly, but that desire returns before the play is over. Corsino's appetite at the start of the play is purportedly for Olivia, who hungers for and indulges herself in her own grief. Uh, the Duke's actual love, too, is for his own act of longing. Uh, could you have a love for your own act of longing? Uh -huh. And for his own ex exclamations of sentiment, the desires of both are directed outward before the play is over. But until a particular musical mechanism, which will be the mention later on, has been set to work, the Duke will haunt his own heart and his desires. Quote, like fell and cruel hounds, unquote, will continue to pursue him. The music in Act Two, seen for, is of such, just such a nature to appease the Duke's extreme sentimentality, or Sino, or Sino makes it plain what sort of sound he wants to hear. Now, good Cicero, but that piece of song, that old and ancient antique song we heard last night, uh, me think, thought it did relieve my passion much, more than light airs and recollected terms of these most brisk and giddy paced times. Uh, this is a familiar sentimental attitude, the desire for the good old song that nudges the memory. The modern request made of the cocktail pianist. <laughs> Just like saying, can you play me a song by, like the, the piano player, the piano, the piano man. It's like saying, could you play a song for me, piano man. <laughs> Here we have a talking about the cocktail pianist. <laughs> They have an ironic translation in Bertolt Brecht Happy End, where the singer tries to re recapture better days by imploring Joe, mock de musica de Van Damsel Nacht, uh -huh. Orsino's favorite song, he says. In old and plain, the spinsters and the knitters in the sun, the free maids that weave their thread with bones do use to chant it. It is silly sooth that and dallies with the innocence of love, like the old age. So here he's requesting a song from the piano man. An old song, some song, familiar song. So we now encounter the role of the cocktail pianist. Uh, mm -hmm. We were reading from Twelfth Night, Shakespeare, the concepts of music in the untuning of the sky, which you can retune somehow.